Typical blogger Charles LeBlanc would be the first to tell you he doesn't have many friends in the Fredericton police force. Police raided his apartment three months ago, a little over three months ago actually, and he was later accused of defaming an officer on the force. That case was supposed to be heard in court today, but it's been delayed. Here's Charles LeBlanc's lawyer, Stephen Folds. Well, Charles was uh, scheduled to appear in court to face a charge of criminal libel, and I've been advised that that's not going to happen. That doesn't mean that there won't be a charge uh, down the road, but uh, in New Brunswick, Crowns review charges before, uh, before they are laid by the police. In this case, uh, that review has not been completed. It's being uh, undertaken by a senior Crown. I don't have any opinion about what might or might not happen in this case. Um, I can tell you, first of all, that this has been difficult and frustrating for, for Charles. Uh, it's been uh, three months since the raid on his apartment and the, he was arrested at that time for this charge. So um, I, am, uh, I can tell you that there's been some concern nationally and locally about prosecutions under Section 301 of the Criminal Code. There have been uh, four jurisdictions in Canada that have found this section of the code to be unconstitutional. And so I'm hoping that the, uh, the Attorney General and her staff are looking closely at this section before they make a decision to proceed. Stephen Folds is Charles LeBlanc's lawyer. Now, LeBlanc might be a thorn in the side of certain authorities, but he's winning some influential allies. Six professors from the law school at the University of New Brunswick have written to New Brunswick's Attorney General, Marie-Claude Blay, about his situation. They're urging the Attorney General to think twice before allowing prosecutors and police to pursue a charge of defamatory libel against LeBlanc, pointing out that Fredericton Police used a section of the criminal code that courts in uh, other provinces have already declared unconstitutional and that, quote, as a result, a prosecution for defamatory libel is neither likely to result in conviction, nor can it be said to be in the public interest to subject an individual to prosecution under an unconstitutional law. Now, Eula Hughes is one of the law professors who signed that letter, and Professor Hughes is with me in the studio now. Good morning. Thanks so much for coming in. Good morning, Terry. What was it about the... Charles the Block case that convinced you that someone from the law school should speak up before it proceeded? Well, it's not so much um, just his case. It's the, the principled question whether we should, um, as, a, um, as a public, support um, a statement that it is in our interest, right, our collective interest, that we prosecute somebody under a law that we understand pretty well is not consistent with the Charter. Why intervene now? This has been going on for three months. Well, the court date um, was shaping up. Initially, um, it wasn't clear whether he had already been charged. The very first news report seemed to suggest that he had already been charged, and then there was um, significant delay in that process. And so um, it presented an opportunity to um, spend some time to think about um, the implications of charging somebody under that law. And um, it also and um, it also presented an opportunity to um, consider um, what the sort of the balance is between uh, advantages to testing this law in New Brunswick uh, on the one side and uh, exposing somebody uh, like uh, Mr. LeBlanc to prosecution and so we had an opportunity to carefully consider that because of the length of time and then uh, we felt that um, it was appropriate to address uh, the Attorney General prior to a decision being made about a charge because that is really a, a great opportunity that we have in, in New Brunswick is that we are what's called a charge screening jurisdiction. We look at charges, bef uh, the, a, a Crown Attorney looks at a charge before it is laid so that we're not getting somebody involved in the system unnecessarily. It seems like a fairly significant intervention on behalf of you and, and the other five professors at, at the law school. Did you have any hesitation in going public? No, no we did not. Um, it, as I say, it, it's not so much an individual case as the point of principle that we don't feel um, it is consistent with the obligations of um, the Attorney General to protect 
um, the public interest, um, and, and we felt it was important to make that point. From a legal perspective, how do you assess, how do you determine what the public interest is? Um, well, the, the Crown, when they, when they make a decision to um, approve a charge, they have to ask two questions. They have to ask, is it likely that a conviction will result? Um, and uh, they're not supposed to go ahead if that's not if there's not a, a reasonable prospect of conviction. So we don't expose people to the criminal process unless that's the case. And normally we assume that it is always in the public interest to proceed with a charge um, where um, conviction is likely. Right? But um, there are sometimes um, countervailing considerations. So for example, um, there's been quite a bit of discussion in this province and elsewhere about um, uh, prosecuting people for exercising an arguable treaty right. Um, so sometimes it's not in the public interest to prosecute because there are other things going on, um, even though you might have a good chance of getting a conviction. But most of the time we assume it's in the public interest to go ahead. On the surface, what is your interpretation of of what's going on here with this case? Well, it's very difficult to know what's actually going on because we actually know very little so far, right? We really haven't had that airing that would occur in a, in a court of law. Um, the, the concern, uh, well, one concern at least, um, that arises from the intervention of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association in this case, and as you're aware, they've also written um, on a number of occasions um, asking questions about this case, um, is just the particular involvement that the Fredericton police have had in, in the way this has been going forward. It seems at least possible that there is a, a conflict between um, protecting the public, something the police have to do, and protecting sort of their own interest in, in their reputation or, or whatever else they're perceiving. And it seems to me quite important that police make a clear distinction between those two ideas, right? They're not there to protect themselves, they're there to protect us. And, um, and when they do that in a way that, um, that veers off towards protecting themselves, that actually affects negatively the reputation both of the police and the justice system as a whole, and we're quite concerned about that. The city as well? Would there be a spillover effect on the city's reputation? Um, I, I don't know that because it's not my perception, at least, that there has been sort of political direction from the city to proceed in this, uh, in this manner. It seems um, localized, at least from my understanding of the reports, um, to, to the police force making certain decisions about how to protect their, uh, their best interests. There seems to be a particular focus on the question of whether the officer who accuses LeBlanc of defamatory libel was involved in the actual arrest of Mr. LeBlanc. In, in lay terms, why is that of particular concern? Well, um, my understanding was that he may also have been involved in the execution of the search warrant. And, and that was the question that the Civil Liberties Association actually asked of the Fredericton police. And my understanding is that they did not get an answer to that question, which sort of suggests that, you know, if the obvious answer was, well, no, he wasn't there, then that would have been an easy answer to give. So there's at least a perception out there that he might have been involved. And, and generally speaking, you don't want a, an alleged victim of crime being involved in the investigation of that crime. I mean, we don't invite the assault victim, for example, to participate in the search warrant. We don't do that. But would you, would you assume that the people running the Fredericton Police Department would be aware of that, of that perception and, the, and the, the negativity associated with that perception? I, I find it hard to believe that they would not be aware of that. I mean, that seems extraordinary if they, if they weren't. Uh, it, because the whole thing is under a bit of a cloud of a possible perception that this is a personal vendetta. And so how would you avoid that perception? Well, the first thing you would do is you make a very clear distinction between the people investigating the concern and the people who are directly affected by it, right? That would make, um, draw, draw that distinction quite well. And, and if that officer was involved in, in the execution of the search warrant and the arrest, then you have not drawn that distinction. And that, that um, makes the cloud darker. <laughs> Professor Hughes, what are the Attorney General's options here? Um, well, the, the, um, the Crown, whoever is in charge of the file, um, has to make a decision as to whether to approve the charge. And 
um, the Attorney General does not have, uh, and we say that in the letter, does not have a role to play in, in de determining the individual question, should a charge be laid in this case. But the Attorney General does have a policy role to play, to say, well, in this province, do we want to routinely charge people under laws that have been found to be unconstitutional and that in, on any proper legal analysis are at least constitutionally vulnerable, right? It's not the case that any court in New Brunswick has said um, this law is unconstitutional, so it's not technically the case that the law is off the books here, if you like. Right. But um, courts in other provinces have said that, and it's easy to see why they have said that, because the, the section is so far-reaching and um, clearly infringes on people's freedom of expression. And we can see that in Mr. LeBlanc's case, right? He says something critical about the police, and next thing he knows, if people bang him down on his door. <laughs> let's, let's assume for a second that the, the Attorney General um, decides that this, that this should not proceed. What does that mean for Mr. LeBlanc? What avenues does that open for Mr. LeBlanc? Well, first of all, it, it probably means that um, he can initiate a process of getting his things back, the things that were seized um, in, the, um, in the execution of the search warrant. And my understanding is that that's a fairly significant amount of um, stuff that, that he has an interest in retrieving. Um, there's, there's a possibility, I suppose, of, of taking civil action against the police. These tend to be very, very difficult to do, though I'm not sure that that's something he would want to pursue, but um, he would have to show that there was something malicious going on, and that ten, tends to be a difficult thing to prove. A civil action as in, as in what? Um, malicious, uh, well, uh, improper investigation, I suppose, or um, um, malicious prosecution if they were to go ahead to a certain point, but that, that would require a charge being laid. And if the Attorney General decided that this case should not proceed, what, what precedent does that establish here in New Brunswick? It, it doesn't. The, the, the Crown could in another case um, proceed on, on a, a different, in a different situation, but the same concern would arise. Um, do we actually want to um, prosecute people under, under laws where we have serious doubts about the constitutionality. Thank you so much for your time. Great to have you in the studio. Thanks very much, Terry. Eula Hughes is a professor of law in the law faculty at the University of New Brunswick. She and five of her colleagues, professors Janet Austin, Nicole O'Byrne, David Bell, Karen Pearlston, and Vanessa McDonnell, McDonnell, have written to Attorney General Marie-Claude Blay, urging her to put a stop to potential prosecution of local blogger Charles LeBlanc. Well, if you have thoughts on this story, we sure would like to hear them. You can send us an email, infoam at fredericton.cbc.ca, or you can uh, send a message to me on Twitter. My address is at S-E-G-U-I-N-C-B-C. You can also call Talkback if you like, 451-4100. Our toll-free number is 1-800-561-4222. It's 7.30. It's time for the news. Here's Jennifer Sweet. The province's health minister says some sections of the Perth 